prayer. Gracious God, we thank you this morning for this wonderful time of laughter and, and smiles this morning as we gather in your house. Father, we give you the praise and glory this morning for bringing us here. Lord, touch us in a special way, and, and we were going to try to center our hearts on you and to listen to that still, small voice that speaks to us. Father, worship with us, worship to us, worship uh, in, in, in conjunction with us. Lift our hearts. Father, we just ask that you speak to us. And Lord, that you hear our prayers, you hear our songs, and you hear our words. Because it's because of you we can be here today. And we thank you and praise you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Take your hymnals, please, and stand. Turn to page 82. A familiar hymn to all of us. Victory in Jesus. Praise God for the victory that we can have. Well, I have some uh, praises this morning we need to share, praise God moments. The first one is about Terry Davis, Kay's brother. Uh, the word miracle has been used by doctors. Now, I know that is something that's rarely heard by doctors, but his surgery was very successful. They uh, have clean margins in removing a tumor, 
and it was a very scary approach, I should say. There were some worries among the family, but Terry said, how can I not win with so many people praying for me? And uh, God answered prayers. So we praise God for that this morning. So please continue to remember Terry Davis as he does recover, and we uh, pray for him that everything remains clear and that any tests that he may have in the future will remain clear because God's not done with him yet. Came home yesterday. That's great. So um, we definitely want to pray for his family as they help care, care for him. Also wanted to share a praise um, about Heather Doss. She had a little bit of a scare uh, in her pregnancy this past week. Uh, there was some couldn't detect heartbeats because the baby wasn't moving right and wouldn't get out of the way for the, for the, um, the uh, test. But uh, praise God, everything is normal and everything is on track. And that was a little scary for Becky and, and for Heather and for the family, but we uh, do praise God that everything is normal and all is well. Uh, she was just hiding a little bit, I believe, and didn't want the doctors to see her. So um, that they, she made a way for them to do that. I also want to praise God for Steve Doss this morning. He had a knee replacement surgery last week, and uh, it went very well. Uh, he had a little issue coming home, but um, apparently he's doing okay from uh, my last talking with Becky. But uh, we do want to pray for Becky, and uh, as she gives uh, care for him, he'll, he'll do amens me there. She's nodding. Uh, pray for Becky as she takes care of Steve, but we also pray for Steve that he takes the time to heal, that he doesn't try to get up and do too much too fast. Uh, any other praises this morning? We're back online. Back online, okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry for the technical difficulty, friends. <laughs> Landon. Found a book series, that you're, actual books that you're reading, right? That's right. We talked about that, didn't we? So Landon has had his nose in a book for the last few days, which uh, is a praise for our young friends that like to read. Uh, it's, they're not on these things. They're actually in real live books. And that is, a, that is a praise. Thank you for sharing that. Any other praises? Well, with our praises come our Please God moments. I do want to share uh, the passing of Sherry Luck. We've prayed for Sherry and her family. She's connected to Frank and Larry's. Uh, she passed away this past week. Um, and I believe she's a, a good friend of Becky's. And that family is a good friend of Becky Doss's. So we want to remember the family of Sherry Luck. I also want to lift up Stanton Hockett this morning. I mentioned last week that Stanton had fallen and broken his hip. And he was at the hospital. Uh, he seemed to be doing okay. He was a little incoherent, uh, but coming out of anesthesia and that sort of thing, uh, there may be some issues there. But uh, he was released to go to CLAPS uh, here in Pleasant Garden for rehab, and they were ready to get him up and get him moving. And he had a rough transition to CLAPS, um, so it became somewhat um, a little more severely incoherent. So they took him back to the hospital to do some testing to make sure there's no infections and that sort of thing. Uh, and I have not talked to Herschel today, uh, but I talked to him this past weekend when he was at the hospital most of the night. So we do want to remember Stanton. Uh, if you think about it, send a card so that when he comes home, uh, he'll have those cards. And then if he goes to CLAPS, uh, Herschel can take those to CLAPS and he'll have some encouragement there. But the goal is to get him back to CLAPS and get him up and moving so he can come back home because he is not going to sit anywhere, uh, according to him. So we do want to remember him. Any other prayer requests we need to add or update? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the passing of uh, Jean Gamble Fields, a member here, uh, uh, this past week, who's a English St. Alman Bill Ashton. Of course, Jim, her husband, passed just several months ago, so the Fields family needs that prayer. Absolutely. Yep, definitely. I heard some. Doing the best they can right now. He's in the hospital. Okay. 
I will give a little funny story on Steve. Um, Mary sends me texts with pictures. And apparently he meets with the executive chef of the chapel, of UNC Chapel Hill Hospital and gives him recipe ideas. And so the executive <coughs> chef has been making shrimp and uh, shrimp and grits that are pureed for him to eat. And uh, he is rating the uh, food <laughs> at, uh, at UNC Chapel Hill. So a little funny story every day, yeah. And I got a picture of the executive chef with him taking his critique. So, any other prayer requests? Uh, we have a she and a fourth grader. So it's a little bit of praise God, and then there's still a long row. She um, was in liver failure um, a couple of weeks ago and was completely intubated. And um, they took her off of um, like she's now breathing on her own. And she they she had a visit with our nurse. I guess last week they took her some goodies, and she was responsive herself, but she is on the liver transplant list, so um, they're hoping to take her off. She's made a lot of progress, but it's still, you know, completely up in the air. She's out of school. They're a Spanish-speaking family, so I can imagine there's a lot of obstacles there. Fourth grader in the school at Ramsey 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 Elementary. Uh, Ariana. Okay. Any others? The needs are great. We laugh, we celebrate our praises, but our hearts still are heavy on those that are in need. If no others, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, again, I just give you the, I give you the respect of your power and your might to, to speak to churches all over the world. To speak to, to us as we look to you for guidance, as we look to you for healing, as we look to you for blessings. And Lord, we do thank you for those blessings you've given us, the miracles, as doctors have said, in healing. We thank you for the attitudes of people that are, that are in, in end-of-life situations that are still giving you glory and still just seeking you. And it's because you're strengthening them in their spirit and their, in their soul. Lord, you're touching them in a mighty way. And Father, we do lift those praises up to you. We, we know it's very limited that we can bless others, but you are unlimited in your blessings. So Father, thank you for using us to help others. And we do ask that you touch us in a special way that we can reach out to those that are hurting, families that are struggling with medical issues, our young people, that are hurting silently. And Father, our world that is hurting through wars, through egos, through power seeking. Father, just speak your will to us. Help us help those that are hurting. Give us a glimpse of how we can be used for your service. Lord, we know there are so many that have burdened hearts today. We know you're there reaching out. Lord, we just pray that they will reach back up and grab your hand as you walk with them through their journey, whether it be beyond this life or healing in this life. But we do ask, Lord, where we beg in situations that, that friends seek you because we know you're there, that they seek you, that they hear you, and that they obey you. We thank you for loving us so much. We thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> So take your hymnals again, turn to page 67, another great hymn of the church, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
several friends this morning, so if our young friends want to come down, we'll see what David has on his heart. Says Teacher Appreciation Week. Do y'all know that? Do y'all know the such thing as that? We go out. There we go. All right. All right. So let's have all the teachers out here, former teachers, stand. If y'all don't mind, would you stand, please? Former and present. Got several here. Let's give them a hand. You want to? All right, so these are the people that, that uh, they love you, they worry for you, they teach you, but mainly they pray for you. And I know you don't, I know sometimes you don't realize your teachers pray for you, but they do. They love you a lot. Now, some days their prayers are probably different than other days, <laughs> um, but they do pray for you and they do love you. Um, so um, this is a good Bible verse here that I, I found and I liked. Uh, it says, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. And that's Proverbs 31, 26. So um, I don't know if you knew this, but Miss Simmons was my first grade teacher. And uh, she was. Um, and she was so nice, she wrote me a personal note one time on my report card. And so here it is. <laughs> It says, David's work has improved. If he were less careless at times, his grades would be better. <laughs> his conduct re grade reflects some unnecessary talking. <laughs> so I'm sorry to embarrass you, but I thought I'd have a little fun this morning. But uh, so that's what Miss Simmons said to me, and I'm sure y'all have had that spoken as well about yourselves. So. But I'll tell you about another teacher I had. Um, when I was your age, I was almost nine. Um, I, I don't know, do y'all get a postcard in the mail that shows your teacher who you're going to have the following or the next year, some kind of form of communication? You know, we used to get those. Um, and so it was going to be who my fourth grade teacher was. And so during third grade uh, and second grade, some of those grades, you know, you could hear this lady down the hall and she was screaming and she was yelling. <laughs> And, you know, I was scared to death of this lady. You'd walk by the hall and there'd be kids sitting out in the hallway or kids at the principal's office. And so her name was Miss Batson. Well, I found out I was going to have Miss Batson. And I cried and I cried. <laughs> and I pleaded with mom. They said, don't let me go to school because she was the meanest teacher that was at PG. And so here's a picture of our class. <laughs> So you can see, I circled Paul Ruth. He's, he's, in the, he's in the middle there, the lower, and then I'm over on the, on the other side, and then Miss Batson's in the corner there. But it ended up, she, was, she became one of my favorite teachers. She was a great teacher. I was wrong about her. Um, she was a really great teacher and, and uh, went to several events with her outside of school. Um, but these aren't the teachers, Miss Simmons and Miss Batson aren't the ones I want to talk to you about today. It's, um, Isabel Ronan. You know Isabel Ronan? Have you ever heard of her? Okay. Well, she was born in 1887, so you probably never met her. Um, yeah. So she went to Michigan State 
um, normal college, and she graduated in 1910. This is her picture here. Um, she got her master's from University of Wisconsin a few years later. She never married, and she started working at Tulsa Central High School in 1920, and that's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, she was very simply dressed, um, and um, she actually lived with her sister there. Um, she taught speech and drama for 33 years. And uh, so over that time, she had probably 3,200 students at that, you know, over her career. Um, but she taught, a, she taught a lot. But she taught broad, had a lot of Broadway plays, wanted her kids to perform and, and do different uh, musicals and plays. And, um, and then every, every once a year, she would work with the local radio station, and they would actually go in, and they would uh, do a take over the radio and station for that day, and they would, you know, do the commercials and announce the music and just some outside activities that she would do with her kids, so it was really good. Yeah, she's dead now, yeah. Um, so one of her quotes was, she felt that um, the pressure of performance brought out the best in her students, and I thought that was really good, you know. She wanted her students to be um, challenged a little bit, so... Um, but in 1933, she had a student that came into her room, and that was room B16. And uh, here's his picture. His picture um, is Paul Arant. He was 14 year old. Now, Paul was a student um, that had he had lost his father when he was two years old, and uh, he was raised just by his mother. And uh, when he was a young boy, <coughs> he made a he used to make crystal radio sets, and I tried to make one another day to bring to you, and, and I'm going to have to have some help probably from Charlie Ruth because I hadn't figured out how to make it work yet. <coughs> but uh, So I worked on it for you, so maybe I'll show you some other time. Um, but he loved to listen to the radio, so he would sell these radio sets uh, to help raise money for his family and stuff because uh, his mother was by herself. And so um, he loved to listen to the radio. And so when he came uh, to Miss Arant's room, uh, or I'm sorry, Miss Rowland's room, um, he was looking forward to the radio day when they took over because that was really what he wanted to do um, at the station. Um, but Miss, when Miss Rowland heard his voice, she told him he needed to be on the radio. She said, meet me downstairs tomorrow morning early for school. So they did, and she marched him down to the radio station and she told the project manager there, she said, Mr. Arant needs to be on the radio and I want you to hire him. So they said, well, come back Saturday for an interview. So he came back th that Saturday for an interview and they said, well, we'll hire you, but you're young and you're inexperienced. But so most of the time he just swept the floor, but occasionally he would get to, to work in the radio station, do some commercials or things like that. So he got a little experience. Um, so, and now for the rest of the story. Paul Rent started to use his middle name on the radio station because it was easier for people to understand. Paul Harvey, he had a, uh, so he started using the name Paul Harvey. He had a, a miraculous career as a radio newscaster. I loved to hear him on the radio when I was young. And uh, one time he went back to his hometown in Tulsa and he was speaking at Tulsa Boys Home and he saw Miss Ronan and he went to her and he told her that two women had influenced his life, his mother and her. So um, you never know, you know, what teacher will influence your life over the years. And it may be the one you had this year, maybe the one coming up. But uh, So this week, make sure you tell your teachers thank you for what they do for you. So... We'll have a prayer. Lord, thank you for letting us get together here today and uh, celebrate this Teacher Appreciation Week and uh, just let these kids understand what their teachers mean to them and the guidance and, and knowledge that they share with them and, and the love and compassion they have for them. And uh, Lord, just uh, let them have a great afternoon today and enjoy this week with their teachers. In your name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
Sharon, I do hope you'll come back next Sunday. Okay. <laughs> and David, I always got ends in conduct for talking, so I, I get it. Well, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever been to an art show or an art gallery? Did you enjoy it? Did you know what you were looking at? <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes? Okay, yeah, that's fair. So you usually walk into this, it's, it's sometimes kind of a quiet place, and, and things are spaced out in a very neat design, and there are different pieces of what people call art. Now, these could be paintings, they could be sculptures, or they could be just random things. And sometimes you look at it and go, what in the world? And when you walk around, um, some of the pieces are pretty self-explanatory, and you can kind of see what the artist is saying, and you say, oh, well, look at the use of colors, and look at, they mean this. Or it's very clear by the title of the art or the, the, um, the, the piece that what they're trying to do. And then you look at others, and you're like, you turn your head this way and this way, and you read the title, and it doesn't make any sense, and then you just stand there. you gotta look, you got to look sophisticated as you're standing there, and you're just... <laughs> knowing you ain't got a clue what it, what it is. You're not really sure. Well, how many people have ever taken art history? Even in college or high school or something? Okay. You may have been taught about various time periods and various artists and methods, methods in which popular uh, creations were made. For example, uh, through Pablo Picasso's life, he used various styles and colors that corresponded with the different eras of his life, the different experiences. He had a blue period as it was called, that involved darker colors and he was battling with depression and poverty. And later in life, his work paid attention to the effects of war in the modern world and so he used those colors of war in, in those pieces. But each piece held deeper meaning in relationship to the artist and also a deeper meaning to the world who viewed it. Van Gogh is another popular artist and one piece you may be familiar with is A Starry Night. How many people have seen A Starry Night? It's a beautiful piece. It's a beautiful painting of this town, and it's at night. You see the swirls in the sky and the stars, and, and you see this. But in reality, that was the view of, the, of his window, from his window in the sanatorium that he painted from memory the next day, which I think was very interesting because he couldn't see it at night, so he painted it by memory during the daylight. But that was what he saw when he looked out. He saw down from his, uh, his confined room, his sanatorium room, what the world looked like to him. But one more artist comes to mind this morning, far greater than Van Gogh or Picasso or even your kid's artwork on the refrigerator. And I would dare say that we all experience this artist. So in the beginning of everything, God, the artist, created everything. He created all sorts of things. Now, can you picture this? Can you picture in your mind a, 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 an artist standing at a blank canvas and then the, a masterpiece begins to be placed upon that, ma that, that, that blank canvas with the different colors and things? Stroke after stroke and color after color, the master artist sets into motion a living picture of his creation, his world. In his design, God places everything just so to work together in harmony for the purpose of of having that relationship with him. Everything goes back to him. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created light and created morning and days. In the beginning, God created the waters and the land. He created the plants to grow along the earth, bearing fruits and seeds. He created stars in the sky and the sun and the moon. In the beginning, he created all the living animals, birds and fish, and everything that moves along the ground. In the beginning, God created man. He created man to rule over that land and those animals and those seas, to work that. He created him to work and maintain the Garden of Eden. He was to name the animals and the birds and the fish. This master artist, our perfect God, created all wonderful things on this canvas in the beginning. But there was one more stroke of the brush. One more stroke of the brush. One more thing that this canvas was missing. Now, today is May 1st, and we're quickly approaching Mother's Day next Sunday. Hint, hint, Mother's Day is next Sunday. Again, Mother's Day is next Sunday, for those who may forget between now and next Sunday. But over the next few weeks, we're going to look at different mothers of the Bible uh, through the month of May. 
We'll be looking at the characteristics of these very important women and their contributions in hopes of, of giving us an idea of just how important they really are. Give some strength to our young ladies, our young girls, our young women to see that they can be just as important, just as meaningful as the women of the Bible. But we can't really celebrate mothers just yet until we recognize them as how they were created, as women. So take the, uh, your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 23. Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. This is God's brush stroke. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed the place back up with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. The brush stroke. God's artistry in motion. As one of God's works of art... How do we view the masterpiece of a woman? How do we view the masterpiece of a woman? Well, let's look at this creation just like you would any other piece of art. If you're standing in this art gallery and you're standing there looking all sophisticated, you're looking at it, you're trying to figure it out. So let's look at this. Well, I did a little digging and, and, and seeing how do you actually look at art. How are you supposed to look at art? I Googled that. And they give you some questions, okay? Basic Art 101, you need to be asking these types of questions. Well, so there, these are the questions. The big guiding question is this. What does the artwork mean? Well, quite frankly, I don't know what a woman means. Guys, we don't ever understand. We always misunderstand it. I don't know. But the question is a little deeper than that. The question is, what does the artwork mean to the artist? What does the artwork mean to the artist? In the beginning, God created one of the most complex of all his creations. God made a woman. Science doesn't make a woman. Thoughts doesn't make a woman. Feelings didn't make a woman. Culture didn't make a woman. Only God makes a woman. God, seeing that man shouldn't be alone, he created woman as a helper alongside man. Let me make that real clear. Alongside man as a helper. They were to be fruitful and multiply, creating an earth of God's children until they both ate of that fruit that they weren't supposed to. And since man and woman equally went against God, the man was punished by working by the sweat of his brow and the blood of his body and working the ground and have to eat of the ground. And women would have to suffer severe childbearing pains. Both creations living forever in the beginning will now face certain death because of their failure to listen and follow God's instruction. And they will return to the dust from which they were created. We can read that in Genesis. But what does this artwork called woman mean? It means life to the artist. Life. A woman was created for life. We can read that God gave man a woman to keep the world alive. We couldn't do it on our own. Did God paint her to give us directions when we get lost? Yeah, probably. Did he paint her to make us, call us dumb when we do something stupid? Yeah, probably. But that keeps us alive. Women are the sustainers of life. In the beginning, God was the giver of life, and Eve was the one charged with fulfilling God's will for the world. Life grows in the womb of a woman. Delivered in pain by a woman, raised and nurtured by a woman, growing from child to adult under the care of a godly woman. That is a work of art created specifically and intentionally. That is a beautiful work of art to keep the world alive. Now think about this for a minute. A woman is the only person required to be present during a pregnancy. Right? Does it, would anyone want to dispute that with me? A woman is the only one required to be present during a pregnancy. Men, we simply aren't required during the pregnancy. We just aren't. 
Now, I'm not minimizing the presence of men, but you get June, okay? Without a woman to be pregnant, no one can be born. Think about that. If Eve never had Cain and Abel, the world would never be. Men cannot grow tiny humans inside of them for nine months. Men cannot breastfeed and sustain a small baby. Women, the one God created very differently than men, are the only ones who can sustain life without the help of someone else. You can't tell me that's not a beautiful work of artistry. The second question, what does the artwork mean to other people? Each and every day we go through life side by side with women. Many of us live with women, work with women, socialize with women. But then as I reflect on our interactions as a world with women, many of you in my life here today, we sometimes fail to realize just how impactful you are on the world. We sometimes realize, more often than not probably, just how impactful you are on the world. Now, if you go through the Bible, you will see that women held many different positions and roles throughout history. You can read where some are at the bottom of the social totem pole. You can read where they were at the bottom of the social class, almost to the level of servant like Hagar. You can read about Rahab, the prostitute who helped hide spies for Joshua in the Battle of Jericho. If she hadn't have done that, things would have looked a little different. You can read uh, Tamer's struggles about being childless and widowed too soon, but you can also read about someone like Esther who gave a strong story of a woman rising to power. Very crafted rise to power and status by trusting God's will, trusting God's presence for her life. In the New Testament, stories of, of the woman anointing Jesus, the Samaritan woman at the well, the poor widow who gave all of her possessions, the two coins, uh, in, in honor and worship of the Lord, all she had. And let's not forget Mary Magdalene who traveled with Jesus and heard him speak and then she was one of the ones who went to the tomb and saw the stone rolled away. And she was the first one to say, where did he go? He's gone. What about the sinful woman who washed Jesus' feet with her hair? Mary and Martha who stressed out over Jesus coming to visit. The woman saw him, the, all the women saw in prison before his transformation to Paul because they were Christians. And don't forget Tabitha, the one Peter raised to life. You see, women held many different roles and experienced many different things in our scriptures just like they do today. There are so many more women in our scriptures that we could spend a great deal of our time talking about and probably should. But each one, even down to the women and the girls and the babies who were part of the thousands fed by the bread and the fish, we have to recognize that they are walking, living, breathing testimonies of Jesus Christ. They're testimonies of God's power, they're testimonies of God's design, and they're testimonies of God's love. Those women of the Bible faced circumstances, trials, and battles. They were a combination of being tough and strong mixed with loving and tender. They were humble. They were faithful. They were committed. They were leaders, and while not called queens or rulers at times, they were leaders in their own right and were vitally important to the fulfillment of God's word and his plan. They were his work of art, and they still are. You still are. So, how do other people view this work of art? Well, across the world, the views are different. There are still countries like the ones I read a few weeks ago who specifically target Christian women and do horrible things to them for their faith. Horrible things that we can't understand. Women are still viewed in other places across the globe as second-class citizens, even third-class and fourth-class citizens, facing torture and persecution. And others offer women some opportunities for success and some opportunities for leadership and some opportunities for freedoms. So it, it runs the gamut of how the world views this art. But it's important to understand that while the masterpiece, the, the masterpiece of a life giver was primarily painted as a helper alongside man and partner to fill the earth. God did more than just pull a rib out and create her. He included colors of strength, colors of independence, colors of intellect, and colors of beauty, all different. There's no woman in this room that looks the exact same to another woman. 
Praise God for that. Because that makes you unique, specific, and intentionally created by the artist. Woman is a provider, a thinker, a manager, a teacher, a worshiper, a leader, a skilled worker, a lover, and a mother. And the names can go on. You can go on and on and on and on and on about what woman is. But as we interact in our daily lives with this sculpture of godly design, what does she mean to the world? And then the last question I'm going to ask you, when you look at art and you're standing in this gallery of art, and you're standing there looking at her, trying to figure out what she means, trying to figure out who she is, and how important she is, you need to ask yourself, what does the artwork specifically mean to me? What does this piece of art, this beautiful design, mean to me? I can't answer that for you. That's in your own heart. But over the next few weeks, we look at the different women of the Bible. Consider what special women in your life, as beautiful works of godly creation, mean to you. Is it your mother? Is it a grandmother? A wife? A daughter? A best friend? A co-worker? Or even just somebody you see in a store and you don't know their name? Pause for just a second. And look at the work of art that God has painted. When you see those women in your life, do you see them as works of art, painted specifically for God-given purposes, clay molded into a beautiful creation? Do you thank God? Thank you, Lord, for such a wonderful creation, because without them, world would not exist. So thank you for that. To put that in a little bit, context, a little bit more context, turn to the Gospel of Matthew. This is the last scripture I want to read to you. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. Just how important women are. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah from the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon. Nashan the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and the Jesse the father of, the king, of king David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was, uh, had been Uriah's wife, Solomon the father of Reho Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, Abijah the father of Asa, Asa the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Jehoram, Jehoram the father of Uzziah, Uzziah the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Ammon, Ammon the father of Josiah, Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile of Babylon. I continue. After the exile of ba to Babylon, uh, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abihud, Abihud the father of Eli see, Eliakim, Eliakim the father of Azor, Azor the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Achim, Achim the father of Eliud, Eliud the father of Eliezer, Eliezer the father of Mathen, Mathen the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And last but not least, Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. All that genealogy. All those fathers mentioned, father of so-and-so, and father of this, and father of that, but really look at that. None of that would have been possible without a woman. Think about that. And if that hadn't have been possible, if women had not been built into that genealogy by God's design and God's creation we would not have the gift of salvation found in Jesus Christ. That is a work of art. You are a work of art, specifically and intentionally created by the master artist. So as we go into open worship just for a few minutes, knowing that woman... 
girl growing to be women, you are a work of art made solely and specifically by God himself. You are the art titled woman. What do they mean to us? Lord, we thank you for your beautiful design. We thank you for your master plan for this world, Lord. We thank you that you've given us partners to work alongside, to love alongside, to teach alongside, and to lead alongside us. 
Father, as we leave this place, help us recognize your artistry. Help us recognize your beauty and your design that is a woman. Father, help us lift them up in prayer, lift them up in praise, and be with them in their struggles and in their joys. Father, we do give you praise and glory for them today. Protect us and guide us as we depart this place in your spirit and speak to us throughout our week if it be your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.